Okay, everyone, we're, this is the second video for Tuesday of week two. Um, we just talked about the um, cytoplasmic membrane of um, bacterial cells. Now we're going to talk about the cell wall. Um, our human cells don't have cell walls, but many um, organisms we're familiar with, like plants, for example, do have cell walls that are made of um, cellulose. Um, and lignin, things like that. So bacteria, um, which are unicellular organisms, um, rely on these cell walls to protect them from changes in the environment that might um, cause differences in osmotic pressure that might uh, lead to rupture of the cells. So peptidoglycan is the name of the molecule that's sort of the basis of the um, bacterial cell wall. And this peptidoglycan is, we're going to look at it as sort of a um, uh, linear structure, but really um, it, it is chains of peptidoglycan. They're cross-linked that surround the bacterial cell like a meshwork. I'll draw that on the board um, in a few minutes. Okay, so cross-linked strands of peptidoglycan form a matrix. They're actually in, in pretty much all bacteria, there are multiple layers of this. Gram-negative bacteria, as we'll see, only have a few layers. Gram-positive bacteria have many more layers. So there are differences in the um, thickness of the peptidoglycan in different bacteria. Okay, so what does um, peptidoglycan look like? This is the basic subunit of peptidoglycan. Um, it has two backbone sugars, uh, or its backbone is a disaccharide, let's put it that way, of N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid. Um, these are essentially modified uh, glucose molecules um, that will form into a polysaccharide strand, okay? So alternating N-acetylglucosamine, N-acetylmuramic acid, and attached to this NAM, so you can call this NAG and NAM, attached to NAM is a set of amino acids. Um, in this case, this is an example of, I believe, E. coli peptidoglycan. Um, we have L-alanine, uh, isoglutamate, L-lysine, and D-alanine. So one thing you may immediately notice is that the amino acids that are used in the peptidoglycan um, cross-linking peptide are not um, the same necessarily as are used in making proteins. They can be modified. It's D-alanine, it's the D-isomer, um, it's L-alanine that's used in amino acids. It's all L-amino acids that are used in making proteins. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Um, and this is a modified version of glutamate. You do not need to draw out the chemical structure um, in atomic detail of peptidoglycan. That's why these are just shown as balls here, right? Um, you know, you need to know this in detail, but you should know the names of these two uh, sugars that make up the disaccharide backbone and the fact that there are amino acids here in a peptide uh, with peptide linkages. Um, but they're not always um, the same amino acids as we use in protein. I'd like you to remember that there are several D amino acids that are used in the bacterial cell wall. Okay, so this is the basic subunit of peptidoglycan. Um, and you can see uh, two things here, um, that if we look at E. coli versus Staph aureus, we have different amino acids that are in the peptide crosslinker. And then in E. coli, the peptide linkage between these two side chains is direct, whereas in Staph aureus, as an example, there is an extended interbridge structure here. So that there's actually an additional um, set of amino acids, all glycine in this case, that are connecting the chains, right? So different bacteria will differ in the nature of the peptides and the cross-linking structure uh, here. Um, but this D-ALA as being one of the participants in the cross-linking 
is pretty common and that's actually relates to the ability of certain antibiotics to um, target the um, enzymes called transpeptidases that are making these connections here, these bonds here, okay? So the details of peptidoglycan crosslinkers can vary. The backbone here is the same in these two different bacteria. This one happens to be gram-negative E. coli. Staph aureus happens to be po gram-positive, okay? Um, so understanding how this uh, pep uh, peptidoglycan is made is kind of important because it turns out that this is the target of a lot of antibiotics that kill bacteria, okay? So the subunit is built inside the cell right, in the cytoplasm of the cell, right, so this is our basic subunit here, right, after this third step, um, and you see this is attached to a carrier molecule. It's a, a protein with a modification on the side of it. Um, actually, I'm going to pause here for just a second. Okay. I pause there. I'm back now because I know I made a mistake here. I said back to pernol is a protein. It's not a protein. It's a it's a fairly complex lipid, right? And but at any rate, um, the uh, peptidoglycan subunit is attached to back to pernol, and this back to pernol then allows this um, polar molecule here to flip across to the other side of the membrane. I don't know the sort of the biophysics or biochemistry of how that um, works, but essentially the bactopernol um, allows it to go um, across the membrane and be exposed on the outside here. Now, once it's on the outside, this subunit can be connected to the existing chains of uh, peptidoglycan. So it would be, um, for example, connected to uh, this chain here, as you see in this diagram, and then it's going to be cross-linked to um, the next uh, component of, or, or an adjacent uh, chain of peptidoglycan to make that mesh work. Once the bactopernol has released its subunit, it will flip back around so that it can pick up a new one. Okay, now there, actually before I show you this, quick video. I'm not going to show you all the video, but I just want to point something out here. Let me stop sharing here for a second, which is that in a, just draw a simple small rod-shaped bacteria like E. coli here, essentially what we have with the cell wall is strands of peptidoglycan going around and around. So just think of these as wrapping around this and then just sort of alternating cross links here. And in reality, of course, this would be much, this isn't to scale at all. And there would be multiple layers of this. So this would be sort of a strong, um, but flexible uh, protective layer around the bacterial cell. Now, obviously, as you get to the poles of the cell, the structure has to change a little bit to accommodate the topology of the cell. And in fact, as the cell grows and divides, the, um, it's going to be the cell wall synthesis changing patterns that are going to cause the cell to constrict in the middle here. Now remember from our last lecture that on the inside here, we've got the Z ring, right? The Z ring. And that Z ring is actually going to be interacting through the membrane, through various proteins with the peptidoglycan to change its pattern, right? So as this Z ring constricts, the, the peptidoglycan is going to start uh, altering its synthesis inward as well in the process of cell division. Okay, so if we just um, going to, um, before I go back to sharing, I'm going to click on this video here to show you. Um, and then actually, second, go back to Zoom to get this. I'm going to do screen share and go here. Sorry. 
takes a little bit of time to get all these things going. Now I'm going to, this is a um, video that you can watch on your own, but essentially it's showing how they um, modeled um, peptidoglycan synthesis in uh, cells to see how it could be organized. Um, because as the cell grows, essentially, one thing you have to think about is that not only is this, this uh, building the peptidoglycan is happening so that the cell can grow, right? That's the whole point, so the cell can get bigger. So you have to put in new strands of peptidoglycan as the cell gets longer. And it doesn't just happen at the poles here. In fact, those layers, those uh, peptidoglycan is integrated into um, chains. And so, again, I don't want you to, you don't need to, um, you don't need to watch this all right now, but essentially they're modeling how you can accomplish this and all the things that can go wrong. Um, and then at the end, they get to a model that they think actually explains it reasonably well. So you see this peptidoglycan um, chains being integrated here along the way. Um, and they have models for the trans uh, peptidation. Um, and the, the other thing that this uh, model, if you watch this, will show you is that the cell actually has to sort of slice, um, has to break the peptidoglycan chains in order to add new peptidoglycan chains. It has to at least break the crosslinks in order to add new crosslinks. So I'm going to stop sharing that one now. Um, I encourage you to watch at least a little bit of that. Um, this is got by a uh, one of the big names in the field of cryoelectron microscopy, Grant Jensen at Caltech, um, who has modeled a lot of this. So I, I think it's some really cool videos, and I think you'll get a better feeling for how um, peptidoglycan uh, synthesis actually happens in the context of a whole cell. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, actually, it's just staying here for a second. So you have that image I showed you up there. Um, essentially, just to reiterate, the production of new peptidoglycan is happening by new strands being exerted, inserted between pre-existing strands by breaking the crosslinks, inserting the new chains, and then adding new crosslinks in to, accom to uh, uh, accomplish actually the growth of the cell, okay? Um, okay, uh, lysozyme, maybe an enzyme that a lot of you have heard of before, lysozyme is found um, is made by our own bodies. It's especially common in mucous membranes, tear ducts, that kind of thing. Um, it's uh, easily purified from egg whites. So when chickens lay eggs, there's lots of, lots of lysozyme in the egg whites to kill any bacteria that might get in there, okay? Um, so lysozyme is this defensive enzyme that we make, and its job is actually to break that um, polysaccharide backbone of the peptidoglycan. So it cleaves between the NAM and the NAG here, right? It doesn't cut the cross-linking, it actually cuts the backbone. So that's what lysozyme does. Um, another enzyme that I'm sure you haven't heard of because it's a very, uh, you know, sort of specialized enzyme is called lysostaphin. So as you might imagine that the lyso part of it comes from lysing bacterial cells. I'll show you in just a second what happens when cells are attacked by lysozyme, but essentially it, it reduces the integrity of this layer surrounding them. So lysostaphin is, doesn't cut the backbone, it actually cuts the crosslink. And this is an enzyme that's made by one staphylococcus species, staphylococcus simulans, to uh, attack staph aureus. I should have put that in italics. Um, is competing with the staph aureus in the same environments. So um, staph simulans isn't a significant pathogen. Staph aureus is. So some people think that maybe uh, lysostaphin could be helpful in places where we're worried about 
for example, antibiotic resistant Staph aureus. So that antibiotic resistance is, is an important thing that I wanted to um, tell you about, which is that the peptide glycan synthesis is a really important target for many antibiotics. And among the most uh, common antibiotics that are used by humans are the beta-lactam antibiotics. So these beta-lactam antibiotics all have this common beta-lactam ring, which is shown here as sort of a square structure with a nitrogen in one corner. And there's a lot of other things that can come off of this, but the uh, major groups of beta-lactam antibiotics are the penicillins. There are a lot of derivatives of this. The cephalosporins, the carbapenems, and the monobactams. One thing that I found amazing is that all of these molecules were not invented by humans. They were invented by other microorganisms, by uh, fungi or other bacteria, right, to attack bacteria in the process of competition in, you know, usually in soil, but maybe in the context of a host as well. So all of these beta-lactam antibiotics, this beta-lactam ring, it mimics the transition state of the transpeptidase reaction involving that D-alanine um, in the um, peptide side chain on the peptidoglycan subunit, right? So that's all of these will fit into the active site of transpeptidases and block them from carrying out the cross-linking step of peptidoglycan synthesis. And what you find then is that, sorry, let me shut this off, is that um, blocking cross-linking ends up weakening the peptidoglycan because as bacteria are growing, they need to actually cut chains, add new ones, and cross-link them again. So if you prevent that cross-linking, then the, uh, the peptidoglycan mesh starts to come apart. And if there is any osmotic uh, pressure, um, either uh, usually water coming in because the inside of the cell would be have a higher osmolarity than the outside, or a higher solute concentration. Um, but it could also be, if you're living in a, a hypertonic environment, that there would be higher solute concentrations outside and then the cell would shrink. But in those conditions, these uh, bacterial cells can be ruptured, okay? So that would be what um, the antibiotic treat, the beta-lactam antibiotic treatment would do to bacteria that um, were trying to grow and make new peptidoglycan, okay? So there are ways that bacteria have um, evolved to fight back against beta-lactam antibiotics. That's a, an enzyme called a beta-lactamase. That beta-lactamase would cut the beta-lactam ring so that the structure of the antibiotic is no longer um, a good fit for the active site of the transpeptidase, right? So beta-lactamases are produced by bacteria to be resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics, right? Um, there are ways that we can fight back against that. We can use a drug called clavulanic acid to actually fit in the active site of beta-lactamase and not be able to be cut. So it would then poison the beta-lactamase so that the beta-lactamase can't break down other antibiotics. So this clavulanic acid is used in combination with a potent uh, beta-lactam um, amoxicillin. The combination drug is called Augmentin. Um, I'll write that up on the board here. Um, any of you, if you had persistent ear infections as a kid that amoxicillin was used for, or another beta-lactam was used for, um, then the uh, pediatrician might have been concerned that the bacteria causing those infections were resistant and prescribed augmentant for you so that it would deal with that resistance, right? Um, our last slide here is just showing that um, the cell wall peptidoglycan synthesis process is a common target for antibiotics. It's not just the beta-lactams, it's also the glycopeptides like vancomycin um, or bacitracin, which actually targets the uh, synthetic process 
uh, the back to promote process. Um, yeah, that was the last slide. So we'll stop sharing there and I'm going to stop the recording here um, for this part of the class.